Capitalism got a pretty bad rap when Marx claimed that it's just about grabbing hold of the means of production and exploiting the working class. Of course, there was an element of truth to his fears because some things went badly wrong during the Industrial Revolution. But that's another story. For today, capitalism has been incredibly successful in advancing society. To the extent that it has caused us problems, it's because we haven't properly used it. Hello everyone, once again, from the Tory capitalist dystopia of the United Kingdom. And today we're going to do something a bit different. Not something I traditionally do. I guess you could even call this a reaction video. Although it's not just me sitting on stream watching a video for the first time hoping maybe I'll have some sort of reaction. It's a video I've been watching a couple times today and it's by Sabine Hossenfelder called Capitalism is Good. Let me explain. Now this person nearly has a million subscribers and from what I've heard online she normally covers like quantum physics and sciencey stuff, but for some reason has decided to make a video talking about why capitalism is actually good. Which I actually find quite interesting for someone who has an interest in science that they think capitalism is good. And even believing that capitalism creates scientific innovation. And I guess I just want to respond to a few points in this. I was wondering about the scope of this video because I've been reading like Adam Smith and Karl Marx all day as refreshers. But then I watched it again just before I made this and I was like, I don't even need to quote these guys or like read little extracts of articles I found today and screenshotted because I was like, a lot of the problems of this video are very surface level. Like you will just watch that and you don't have to have a deep understanding of capitalist theory and feel like what she is saying is inherently wrong or it feels like maybe she herself has read capitalist theory and has just made a video about that, but she's arguing capitalism is good using like more modern examples. And in a video about capitalism, she really does not talk about workers. She doesn't talk about the power imbalance. She really doesn't even talk about labor value and doesn't talk about labor value extraction by the capitalist class. I guess you would want to ignore that if you are making a video about why capitalism is good. But yeah, I just thought I would respond to a lot of these points. And again, I was thinking about the scale of this video. I was thinking about even including like a big section about my own opinions of capitalism. I mean, that should be fairly obvious from a lot of content on my channel, so I might leave that off today. And I feel like the video will be long enough if we just stop her video at certain points and then start talking about them. But yes, before we go any further, please like the video. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. If you've seen this video or if you actually subscribe to her channel, I'd be interested to know because a lot of her fans really aren't happy about this. They think the video is very bad and have told her don't make these videos because you don't seem to know what you're talking about in this field despite the fact that you do seem to be a very intelligent person. Also follow me on social media, support me on Patreon. That's capitalism, isn't it? Just, you know, giving people donations is capitalism, I guess. But yeah, check out the Patreon if you want to support my work and also check out the subreddit and all the other stuff. The links are in the description. Now, like I said, her audience are not very happy about this video. And um, before we get into the video, she posts this saying, uh, is capitalism the reason the world is going to hell in a handbasket or is it going to save us? What is capitalism anyway? How does money work? And when do free markets fail? This video is a brief summary of a dip I did into microeconomics literature in a dark hour of my life. And I think what she's saying there about literature is very relevant because it doesn't feel like what she's talking about has much relevance to the real world beyond economic theory, right? But again, it's a video arguing why capitalism is good. And she talks about how capitalism could maybe be used to save us from climate change, right? Not that it's like the primary cause of it. And people in the comments, again, not happy at all. They're saying stuff like, uh, just yikes, Sabine stick to science. I would never have even considered unsubscribing from your channel before this, but this one video you've convinced me. Wow, Sabine, you're treating us with an early April Fool's joke. One of the greatest examples of don't quit your day job in the history of the internet. Considering all your simping for Elon over the past year, I should have seen this coming. If you keep doing politics, then I'm just going to stop watching your videos. I'm sorry, just please don't do politics. I'm here for science and that's your expertise. After the trans video, it was clear the direction your channel was headed towards. 
Too bad the old physicist goes into other areas of academics without giving them enough research and starts making really dumb points is still going strong. That reminds me of Jordan Peterson. And I don't know anything about this person. Didn't watch their trans video. Don't want to spend too much time on the creator as a person. I just really want to deconstruct the arguments made in the video. So I have my notes in front of me, which I wrote today. And I'm probably going to watch the video while I'm recording this as well. Now, she starts the video for the first five minutes explaining, like, what money is. And that's perfectly fine. Like, the way she explains it, like, really don't have much of an issue with it. She's just giving you a rundown of, like, you know, how money works. But around the three-minute mark, um, she starts explaining what a capitalist is. And I find this very curious in a video about why capitalism is good. She basically gives us a scenario of someone wanting to make apple cider from all the apples they've grown. And someone who's made money from chicken farms has offered to give them money for like an apple press to make the cider or apple juice. And then if it becomes successful, he pays this person back and gets to keep the money. Isn't that so nice? Benevolent investors. But this is the only reference to a capitalist Sabine has in the video. And yeah, this does sound like a capitalist investor. But what she's missing is... How did this person in the first place accumulate their capital? In the video talking about why capitalism is good, are we simply meant to believe from this point that Sabine is saying this person just raised her own chickens and sold them on her own? One person farm, family farm, no other workers involved. All right, so we have money, but our busy traders still have a problem. Suppose you have a lot of apples and not sufficiently many people to buy them. Your amazing apples rot away. What a shame. You would like to make apple juice from them, but you can't afford a juice press, so your breakthrough innovation doesn't come into being. That sucks. However, your friend Sue has been getting really rich with all her chickens. So rich, in fact, she's sitting on a big pile of money that she doesn't know what to do with. Sue sees your problem and offers you a deal. She gives you some of her money so that you can buy your juice press. You just have to agree that if you get rich with your juice press, you give her the money back plus something on top. That money which Sue gives to you is your capital. And such was born the capitalist. The capitalist is a personal institution who provides capital to those who want to launch a new business. Someone who's able and willing to take the risk that this capital will never have a return on investment. What she's describing there is more like an entrepreneur than a capitalist. Although they are pretty much interchangeable, an entrepreneur is someone who will risk their money. How did this person and how do capitalists generally get their capital, right? If you have enough surplus capital to start investing in things, of course you can just be someone who's worked a typical nine to five, a corporate nine to five, you've accumulated a lot of wealth for your salary, and on the side you start investing in different things. But I wouldn't necessarily say this makes someone a capitalist in the traditional sense. A capitalist is someone who extracts labor value for profit of their workers, right? So it could be someone in this example with the chicken farm. This farmer owns a farm, has many workers who run the chicken farm and extracts their labor value for profit. Therefore, they have more capital to invest in other things to keep generating themselves profit on top of the labor value they're extracting. The example Sabine has given there isn't a good example of what a capitalist is because she's just telling us that a capitalist is someone who has money and invests it. And that's not what most people will tell you what a capitalist is. Like Elon Musk, right? That's a capitalist. Capitalist in the way she says he invests in stuff, but also his capital is from stolen wages. It is from labor value. Labor value is of course something, you know, that Adam Smith recognize, you know, like for example, resources like wood, that is not something with inherent value. It's the labor which changes the wood into something you can use. That's what has the value. And Karl Marx expanded upon this in his own work. If you're going to make an argument about why capitalism is good and ignore something which even the father of capitalism talked about in terms of capitalism, then I think we have already started the video on a bad foot. But yes, capitalists aren't just people who nicely start investing in your business idea with the hope they'll get a return on investment. 
they do do that. But generally capitalists are people who own businesses and make profit and capital at the expense of their workers. So then about four minutes in, she goes to talk about how profit drives innovation and progress, essentially. Scientists tend to associate the stunning societal progress we've seen since then to science and technology. But I think that's having it backwards. The driver of all this progress was the capitalist system that allowed an efficient allocation of resources. By resources, I don't just mean raw materials, but also goods and human resources. Capitalism is a system that distributes these resources without anyone needing to have an overview, just by interactions between traders. It's pure genius if you think about it. And that's why science took off, not the other way around. So I really had to watch that clip a couple of times right now to really choose what I was going to focus on. So she ends it by talking about like progress of humanity and science is because of capitalism, which allows an efficient distribution of resources around the world. And it all relies on like the relationship between traders and I guess the desire for certain things and goods and services and resources. But Capitalism being efficient at allocating resources, labor, or whatever to where it's needed is just so laughable. Like, if that's true, why do we have so many people starving to death all the time? If capitalism is so efficient at providing people what they need, like I said, if people are hung if people are going hungry and starving to death, then it's clearly not an efficient system, even more so than we actually produce in a capitalist system enough food to feed the entire planet. We let food just rot because we don't want to dump it on the international market and deflate the own price and eat into our own profit because we make food as a commodity, not something to feed someone. So yes, in like a more Western capitalist system, you might have this working a bit more where if there's demand in certain countries for a certain thing, then a company will go sell their product there, right? But it completely ignores global capitalism, both contemporary and historically, because what often happens is if you have like the British Empire, which was capitalist and had loads of corporations in bed with it, they steal resources from poorer countries like India, for example, when you have something like the Bengal famine or the Irish famine, which is literally caused by capitalism. If capitalism is so efficient at redistributing resources and stuff like that, then why did all these people die in famines when there was enough food? And why do so many people around the world die from hunger if capitalism is the most efficient way to redistribute these things? And why is there still such a power imbalance in the world built on the backs of European colonialism if capitalism is something that's efficient at redistribution of resources? Capitalism is anything but an efficient system. If it was an efficient system, there wouldn't be so much waste. There wouldn't be so much waste at every single level. Like we've all seen those videos of giant corporations just throwing out food, which is perfectly good because they don't want to give it to homeless people, right? Capitalism is not efficient. What it is efficient at doing is extracting profit from people and globally extracting profit from poorer nations, right? It's efficient in that way. It's not efficient in meeting the needs of society and it's not efficient in furthering the progress of humanity itself. She ended talking about science as everything is done for profit. Now on this note, this is probably the worst thing she says. She makes an argument that the only reason people got access to penicillin was because of capitalism. And if you're making a video about why capitalism is good and you're including the pharmaceutical industry, you are very, very misguided. And I speak as someone who has a fair degree of knowledge on the pharmaceutical industry. I was a pharmaceutical industry journalist for about a year before I became a full-time YouTuber. And I just want to play this and then react to it. Remember that story about how the Scottish physician Alexander Fleming supposedly accidentally discovered penicillin in 1928 and saved the lives of countless wounded soldiers in World War II? Yeah, well, that isn't really what happened. First of all, scientists had discovered that the fungus penicillin inhibits the growth of bacteria decades earlier. Fleming's contribution was that he realized the fungus was shedding a particular substance, which he called penicillin. But he pretty much left it at naming the stuff. 
it wasn't until 10 years later that a group at the University of Oxford set out to find a way to grow the fungus and extract penicillin in large quantities. They then conducted medical trials and once they were sure penicillin was both safe and effective, their method was scaled up by the pharmaceutical industry. Two members of the Oxford group later shared the Nobel Prize with Fleming. So what saved all those many lives wasn't just Fleming's observation in a petri dish. The game changer was producing the stuff in large quantities and bringing it where it was needed. Innovation and industrialization ultimately going back to capitalism. That's what saved all those people. Pretty laughable that she believes penicillin was distributed efficiently because of capitalism. Plays into my last point as well, like, do you think... All those people in the British colonies, you know, the subjects of the British Empire, were getting good access to penicillin at the same rates of people in Britain itself, for example. Like, we have that power imbalance. But before we go into this kind of story as a gateway into talking about Big Pharma, someone just wrote this comment, which I liked. So, um, how is the story of penicillin a triumph of capitalism? It was discovered at a voluntary hospital then studied at Oxford. The research to learn how to mass produce it was provided with support from World War II military projects under the British and US governments. Yes, when it came to getting lots and lots of the product to World War II GIs in the field, the militaries of these countries included private sector companies, but not exclusively, and they could just as easily have exclusively used a nationalised health service industry if one existed, in the same way they produced tanks and aeroplanes. Capitalists didn't create the phenomenon of penicillin used in World War II, they just got their beaks wet at the end, and they would have never been able to do that without the research and dedication of people who were not profit-driven, even if the consumer demand, at least at its first is flourishing as a product, was manufactured not by the market but by the military and its battle with the Germans, which created fresh wound infections and bouts of close quarter diseases. When it comes to talking about things you don't know and pretending your role as a science communicator gives you the authority to espouse moderate liberal gobbledygook, this is strike two, the trans video was strike one. So why I want to talk about that is of course that comment is true, that something like penicillin was built on stuff that wasn't for profit. And we saw this with COVID in some ways as well, like Operation Warp Speed by the Donald Trump administration, the amount of times I've written about this in 2020. But it was basically the US government, with the help of private industry, using all their combined resources to get this vaccine out as quick as possible and for free as well to people. It was using the facilities made by Big Pharma in combination with the US government to do this, right? To get it to the people. It had to work with them in this regard. But like this comment was saying, these things aren't made because of capitalism. And if you have something like a national health service, the government will pay for these things as well to give to the people and won't sell it at a profit. Now, in the US, you don't have this relationship with Big Pharma like in the UK, where thanks to like the one good thing Tony Blair did, set up NICE, which is a body of the NHS to help regulate drug prices and to ensure that a pharmaceutical company can't come to the UK and start just jacking up the prices and just put a product in the market, which is extortionate, right? Can't do that here. But the argument that capitalism efficiently distributes, you know, medicine, it's insane as well, because it all comes back to global capitalism. If you want to make the argument in a vacuum, Operation Warp Speed was a good thing, because in a capitalist system, you have to play nice with big pharma, right? That's just the reality of the world. And they did this where you could get a vaccine for free to save you for a disease because it was in the public interest. But during this time, poorer countries still couldn't get access to the vaccines, and certain countries like Cuba had to actually make their own. And then like the Chinese government made its own as well to just give to its citizens because it's in the interest of public health and not strictly profit. And yes, sometimes it will have to use the facilities of private industry, but efficient distribution of medicine generally, like penicillin, for example, or a whole host of drugs, isn't made more efficient under capitalism because under capitalism, companies will literally not sell their drug in certain countries that need it, or they will sell it at a rate which is so extortionate people will buy knockoffs which are dangerous to their health. So making the argument that medicine is distributed properly because of capitalism is just like absolutely insane. And the US system itself is a great example of this. 
because you don't have proper price regulation. The FDA doesn't regulate drugs properly either. So what happens is you get someone like Martin Scarelli who buys up a company and then can jack up the price of a drug that only a small minority of people need and say, oh, I need it to recoup the cost, right? But what should actually happen is the government should provide that drug to the US citizens so they can live. And even if we are thinking in terms of capitalism, the US government should do that so people can continue to work and pay income tax. But as we're going to talk about later, of course, the US government is like three giant corporations in a trench coat. It doesn't actually care about the welfare of its citizens, even if it would be beneficial to the economy. I acknowledge reality, but in theory, right? Everyone should just have healthcare. Everyone should just have access to medical treatments. We should make medical treatments to make sure people don't die, right? We shouldn't do that for profit. And I'm well aware, like we can't do that right now. I'm well aware we are in this global capitalist system, but I am not making a video about capitalism being good and using big pharma as an example, right? Because in a communist moneyless society, we would just all do stuff for the benefit of humanity and the benefit of people. So we would develop drugs for cancer or whatever. We cure all these diseases so people can live not for profit. Because if you start doing things for profit, you start ignoring certain illnesses because it's not profitable and those people continue to die and there isn't treatments made because it won't make a profit, right? So we cannot argue if capitalism is meant to be good, that big pharma is a good example of this because how many people die around the world from not having access to treatments they desperately need because capitalist corporations won't actually sell there because they won't make a profit or how many people die because there never has been proper research into certain conditions because it's not profitable. And related to that, even pharmaceutical companies right now are not trying to diversify antibiotics because they only care about profit, even though this could create a super bug which just like decimates the global population. And that's linked to the food industry where they stuff all these farm animals with antibiotics which help increase antimicrobial resistance, right? And it's all because of profit all because of profit, because capitalism is a death cult which doesn't think about the future, but Sabine here actually seems to think they do, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Now, the biggest problem with this video, and people have all acknowledged this, is she often acknowledges counter-arguments, but then just doesn't engage with them. So here is her talking about Karl Marx quick. Capitalism got a pretty bad rep when Marx claimed that it's just about grabbing hold of the means of production and exploiting the working class. Of course, there was an element of truth to his fears because some things went badly wrong during the Industrial Revolution, but that's another story. For today, we just need to know that capitalism, like fiat money, requires a governing institution. So look, I'm just going to say, if you're making a video about why capitalism is good, and you're going to even reference Karl Marx, someone who inspired anti-capitalism globally and, and still inspires people to this day, with his views on capitalism and his economic theory, right? You can't just say, yeah, he was kind of right about some things, but that's another story, I can't acknowledge that. Because if you're not even talking about labor exploitation and talking about how capitalists accumulate capital, you can't just acknowledge Karl Marx and dismiss him because it just shows you don't really know what you're talking about, right? Because it's just very naive to dismiss Karl Marx so quickly because what a lot of economists do who don't like Karl Marx is of course like they rebut him in like massive essays and stuff, right? And they write about why Marxism is wrong, which I wouldn't agree with, but of course they're coming from a place of them studying like economics as well. But if you don't know economics very well, you're just going to reject Marx and act like, you know, oh, no big deal. I'm not even going to acknowledge the relationship he painted between workers and the bourgeoisie. But let's keep going a bit further. So uh, in the next clip, she starts talking about how capitalism has been enormously successful in pushing societal progress. And you wouldn't want to live in countries that don't do it. Like Laos, North Korea... And like, bizarrely, even Cuba gets on this list. Even so, capitalism has been enormously successful in unlocking societal progress. And the nations who still don't use it, such as North Korea, Cuba and Laos, are places you don't want to live. So I don't want to talk about this point too much, but she's basically saying, you know, communist countries that don't adhere to the capitalist system uh, haven't had societal progress, which is insane. So because they haven't had a profit motive, these countries listed here haven't had any societal advancements. And you wouldn't want to live there. You wouldn't want to live in Cuba compared to anywhere else in the world. I'm pretty sure a lot of people in the world would actually want to live in Cuba 
than their own countries, especially countries that are far poorer, corrupt governments, war-torn. But also, I think this shows a bit of naivety here as well, because first of all, North Korea, Laos, and Cuba are not the same at all, right? And they all still exist in a global capitalist system. North Korea has like basically taken itself out of that. But that's one example. Laos hasn't, and although ruled by a communist party, does have to participate in the global capitalist system. The same with Cuba, but because Cuba has been isolated from fully participating in the capitalist system, it has had to focus more internally on survival. But it has had societal progress, right? The Cuban government does not prioritize profit above all else, so it has made great advancements in things like healthcare, even internally. Like, it had to make its own COVID vaccines. It even made a lung cancer vaccine as well, right? Its healthcare is very, very good, and the Cuban population actually have higher life expectancy than most places in the world, including the United States, right? So the argument you've just made there that Capitalism promotes societal progress and you wouldn't want to live in Cuba, which I'm guessing because it's run by the Communist Party, hasn't had societal progress, just completely debunks your argument. Because what you would have to do in that example is, oh, Cuba is like the exception to the rule of what I'm making in that it can't fully engage in the global capitalist system because of the US embargo, but it still has had societal progress in things like healthcare, literacy rates almost straight away under the communist government there. So it's a good example of how you can do things without profit incentive and still make things work. Yeah, Cuba isn't perfect. Cuba is a poor country, mainly thanks to the United States. But at the same time, it's also a good example of why you don't need capitalism to look after people and why medical innovation, which she is constantly referencing in this video, does not need a profit incentive. It just needs a government who wants to look after their citizens as it should be, right? Sadly, in the global pharmaceutical capitalist industry, you have to really work with pharmaceutical companies, but it would be great if the NHS could just make like loads of its own drugs without help from these companies. But thankfully with the NHS system, we do have price regulation, meaning you can actually get very cheap drugs, subsidized drugs or drugs for free for life-threatening illnesses. So I wanna skip um, forward a bit to about 10 minutes in where she talks about a free market. Um, and let's listen to this for a bit. Is that free markets only work to everyone's benefit if they're set up properly? Keep in mind that capitalism isn't just a free market. It's a free market plus the governing framework to run it. Free markets do not, for example, work to everyone's favor if some people have insider information, which gives them a trading advantage. This is why we have laws against that. Free markets also work badly if one single company dominates the market sector and can use their power to force customers to stick with them. This is why we have laws against that. So this kind of goes back to my earlier point about her reading like capitalist theory, but not really understanding the reality because yes, there are laws against insider trading. Yes, there are also laws against things like monopoly, right? But what she fails to recognize is that under capitalism, you cannot have a democracy, a proper democracy. So the people who are elected to regulate this stuff or put in place by elected officials to regulate this stuff are influenced by capitalism and profit and influenced by corporations legally, might I add. In the United States, you know, Citizens United, corporations of people, basically legalized bribery in the United States, right? So although in theory, yes, you have laws against insider trading, which are sometimes applied. Yes, you have laws against monopolies, which are sometimes broken up, it doesn't always happen. And we're seeing right now across many industries, lots of companies take paths to becoming monopolies. So Microsoft and Xbox, for example, buying up Bethesda, buying up Activision Blizzard, and they're getting the okay basically from the ruling authorities and judges and stuff because they can influence people to make these decisions for them. Even though we can see before our very eyes, Microsoft is taking steps to becoming a gaming monopoly buying literally the studio with some of the biggest games around, which people like basically only play in some countries like the UK. But then you have stuff like Amazon, you have stuff like Google, you have stuff like Meta, for example, who own Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Freds. Is anyone breaking that up? Because they tried to buy Snapchat as well. What if they bought Snapchat? What if Meta buys TikTok? Are people gonna break that up? They're probably not gonna break it up, are they? 
And we all know that because campaign donations affect how people act in a capitalist system. So yes, in theory, if you're reading economic theory, this is how things might work in the US on paper. But we all know under a capitalist system that our lawmakers don't care about the people for the most part. They care about cozying up to corporations to get a job later on because capitalism severely undermines democracy if all the people in charge care about is either appeasing corporations to maybe get a job later or being bribed by these corporations and just putting these profits at the head of everything. Like, like how much does the US spend on defense? How much does that go to defense contractors, right? How much do pharmaceutical companies lobby the US government to not introduce price regulation, make drugs affordable to people? How much does health insurance companies lobby the US government to ensure that the US government never does something in the interest of the public, right? It's a great example of how capitalism doesn't work because it influences the politics so much, right? So she's saying there, you know, this is the law. This is why it's good and you need to set up a free market properly. But what happens in the US, like the pharmaceutical industry, for example, you have a couple massive pharmaceutical companies in bed with the US government and the free market exists only for them to be able to jack up the prices without consequences, right? And in theory, monopoly shouldn't be allowed to happen. But also in theory, she's saying there, the free market should be allowed for these companies too. So they should be able to jack up the prices. But you're seeing there how the capitalist system in many ways, which she outlines of it being good, like the pharmaceutical industry, it severely undermines these industries and in many ways just makes them completely exploitative and don't help anyone. So now let's go even further forward. And I think this is important as well. She talks about um, capitalism and climate change. And everyone can see that since the Industrial Revolution, that the human race has basically been destroying the planet through capitalism. And what I find funny about this video and why it was such like a shock to me is I don't even see many capitalists even defending capitalism at this point. Like we're all seeing the earth absolutely like heat up before our eyes because a couple of corporations want profit above all else and bribe our governments to continue doing it because it's a death cult at the end of the day. But now let's listen to her talk about this stuff for about a minute. The story for today is that we have known that externalities can lead to market failures since the middle of the last century. Carbon dioxide emissions are such an externality. For the market to optimize the use of fossil fuel resources, we should have put a price on releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We did not. And that's why we're now in deep shit. So, yes, our current capitalist systems do have a problem with environmental protection, but the reason isn't that there's something wrong with capitalism per se. It's that we didn't set it up correctly in the first place. Basically, the origin of the problem is that no one paid attention to economists. And unfortunately, we still don't pay enough attention to economists. The current situation is that companies who voluntarily produce environmentally friendly goods put themselves at a competitive disadvantage because other companies exploit the environment at zero cost. This moves the burden onto the consumer. If you want to buy a climate-friendly product today, you face extra costs because fossil fuels are cheap and getting to net zero is not. This makes no economic sense and it'll ultimately not work. It's completely upside down. Products whose production causes damage to the environment, which then requires adaption and mitigation, should be more expensive, not less expensive. So there's multiple things to respond to there. So she basically thinks because there wasn't a larger tax on pollution and emitting CO2 emissions back in the day, that's why we're in the situation we are now. The US government or whatever government simply said, you know, you are being charged for all the CO2 you emit, these companies would still do it. They wouldn't care. They have so much money. What people don't understand is like pharmaceutical companies, going back to this, like that Johnson & Johnson stuff with the talc powder giving people cancer, right? They have billions put aside for lawsuits, right? They literally have like rainy day funds to deal with all these lawsuits. And it's totally worth breaking the rules because they have so much money to deal with the consequences because it will always just be a fine. We're seeing that with the Sacklers right now in Purdue Pharma. Who's being charged for that? They killed like 600,000 people with, with OxyContin and they knew. Who's being charged for that? Why aren't they all in prison? All of that family should be in prison, but no, they just give away the money, they give away the company, convert it to some sort of charity because capitalism 
isn't about protecting people. It's about profit above all else. And these people wouldn't have cared even if they had to pay a carbon tax because capitalism is all about profit. And it's actually, if you are a good capitalist, you will pursue profit as much as possible. And often these companies that pollute the most, they're doing it legally because they buy the politicians who write the laws through the capitalist system. So there are no consequences to doing this and they just wanna make as much profit as possible. And you're seeing right now, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, they're obsessed with space. They would rather leave the planet a trash heap for the rest of us than try and make things to help us deal with the climate crisis. They don't care. Capitalists don't care. And that's why she also referenced later, it makes no economic sense that green friendly products aren't cheaper. It makes all the economic sense because we are conditioned to not care about the environment and these companies will keep making things that pollute the environment as long as we keep buying them. But And how they maintain that, like I said, through many different avenues, the media, politicians. So we're conditioned to completely keep consuming products which pollute the environment and that's why they're cheaper because we all want them and there's more competition and that's why things like, I don't know, vegan foods are more expensive because there isn't as much competition. Green capitalism doesn't work because capitalism doesn't care about ethics and morals. And what I always said, like one thing the governments around the world could do is like the meat industry, meat consumption, it causes so many issues. Like I said, antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance. It causes huge pandemics like HIV with bushmeat or even COVID could have been from a wet market and stuff, right? But loads of pandemics, regardless of those, have been caused by the meat industry. And also all the ranches in like the Amazon rainforest, which again, contribute to CO2. So the UK government could say something like, we are going to subsidize companies that make alternative meat products, which emits far less CO2 in its creation and distribution, right? We're gonna do that, and by 2050, we want meat to be a luxury choice and not a staple of every single meal for most people in the UK. There is one solution, right, of a government incentivizing companies to diversify, I don't know, whatever product they're making and maybe make something environmentally friendly. But our government's not going to do that because we don't have a democracy under capitalism or we don't have a government that will work for our benefits under capitalism because they're totally in bed with something like the meat industry. So that's why things like vegan products and alternative meat products are more expensive because there's less demand for them and because it's a more niche market, they can charge a higher price for it and there, are, and there isn't as much competition from other companies making these. And even recently I saw like, was it like Beyond Burger was going through like a massive downturn in sales and that's sad because we need more stuff like that to help the environment. And that's just like food. We're talking about oil, we're talking about cars, bikes, all these different things around the world. Under capitalism, they don't need to solve this because they just want short-term profits. And that's it. And they'll keep paying our politicians until the last second. Look at Joe Biden agreeing with all these new oil pipelines, right? That's just a perfect example. The thing is, if I spoke to this person, I can turn nearly every single point they say is good about capitalism on its head and say, this is actually terrible about capitalism and capitalism is destroying the planet and there's a reason people are not doing stuff. We all know capitalism is destroying the planet, but the people in charge, the capitalists, they don't care and they're bought by the corporations who are destroying the planet. In summary, Capitalism has been incredibly successful in advancing society. To the extent that it has caused us problems, it's because we haven't properly used it. The solution is not to abandon it, but to make sure it works to our advantage. There's no simple way to do that, and everyone who claims that the solution is to either discard capitalism or blindly trust it didn't understand the problem in the first place. So that's just a little summary that the reason we're having all these problems is because capitalism hasn't been implemented properly. But what does that even mean, right? Because she's given us a couple of examples of, you know, governments being more involved with capitalism, but there's different strains of capitalism. What we have right now destroying the planet is super individualist neoliberal capitalism, right? People are told that the highest thing in life is to basically be this ultimate consumer and at your workplace, destroy everyone else to try and make as much money as possible. And if and if you're in the capitalist class, do as much to make as much profit as possible, including like treat your workers like garbage, extract their labor value, right? So I don't understand what this means, like capitalism hasn't been done properly. It's constantly being done properly. That's why it's terrible. Incentivizing profit above all else, human life, and even the future of humanity itself is of course terrible, 
But that is capitalism. And as an Irish person, what happened in Ireland with the Irish famine, that was capitalism. They prioritized profit above all else. There was enough food in Ireland to sustain the population after the potato crop failed, right? Because all the food was on land owned by people involved in corporations, all these massive capitalist landowners, they kept exporting the food to places like England when so many people were dying in Ireland from starvation. And that in a nutshell is capitalism. Those people were being good capitalists and they were following capitalism to the letter because they were prioritizing profit. They weren't giving handouts, they weren't doing charity, they weren't being communists, just making food so people could live, right? Crazy concept, I know. They were doing it to make profit. And that's why capitalism is terrible and bad. And a lot of the good things we take for granted in society, like, you know, a cap on working hours for some countries, or the weekend, or, you know, Labor Day was this week, that's because of people who stood up to capitalism and died fighting capitalism. Those are the people we should appreciate and we shouldn't go around while we watch our planet burn saying capitalism is good. So again, don't know much about this person, don't send them hate, don't do anything like that, but I think in a nutshell, it just shows how incoherent capitalist arguments are, because basically every point she makes, I feel like is a point against capitalism, but she thinks it's a good thing, because it feels like to me she's just read some capitalist theory in her spare time, and like she was saying at the end, she feels like capitalism is not being done properly in practice, but it is. And that's what makes it so terrible. So anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.